silence on set. I want to welcome you to our online worship service here at Zion Baptist Church. I know this is a little different and out of the ordinary, but we're so glad that we have this capability to, to bring this worship, worship time to you. Uh, we hate that we can't be with you, and uh, we pray that this will be a source of encouragement uh, and comfort during these trying times. So we're going to do a little singing, and I'll speak, and uh, just uh, lean in, uh, participate, and let them, just, we want you to know that we love you, and we can't wait till we're with you again. Uh, let, let's pray. Lord, we just ask uh, in these days, God, that you help us, that you guide us. Lord, we pray uh, that, that you would just be with this time, be with this music and this message, and Lord, wherever folks view it, Lord, that you will speak to their hearts, that you'll draw them closer to yourselves. And Lord, I just uh, ask, uh, I ask that you be honored and glorified, and God, help us just to keep trusting you as we go through these days. We don't know how long it's going to be this way, but we're so thankful that we have this, these capabilities to, to provide these worship services. So God, speak to your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing some songs. You can sing at home or right there on your couch, in your love seat, whatever you're on. Uh, we're going to sing, There is Power in the Blood.
you're not with us physically here today, but you're at home, and uh, we want you to know how great our God still is, even though we cannot gather together right now, and we want to sing about that. How great is our God? The splendor of the King And clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice Let all the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our god sing with me how great is our god and oh we'll see how great how great is our god
Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven. to you and uh, just this song I want it to be encouragement to you even though what we're going through today it'll be worth it after all through Jesus Christ I promise you keep your faith in him keep your hope in him everything will be alright we want to sing it'll be worth it after all we need our spirit Field preachers to teach us right from wrong. We need our old fashioned seekers who will pray all night long. We need some good guys. another mile cause the church will triumph Lord, and we'll go home in a little while it'll be worth it after Oh 
Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity and this kind of unique situation that we're in, God, just to still worship you and to honor you and to praise you. And God, we just want to take this opportunity to ask you now just to be with everyone that's watching, everyone that's tuning in right now, God, that uh, you just be with their families. Uh, if anyone's sick, Lord, you just pray. pray. Uh, we just pray a healing blessing and a prayer upon them. God, we thank you for our church. Even in these trying times, Lord, we know it'll be worth it. After all, if we keep our faith and hope in you. God, we love you. We honor you. We thank you. God, you be with Brother Nick as he comes. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you'll turn your Bibles to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, we're going to look at a familiar passage of scripture you know there's no sports on tv and they've been canceled and i got to i really miss sports i'm a sportsaholic and i heard about this lady who was so frustrated by the way the umpire was calling her son's baseball game she was so frustrated that she shouted from the stands and she said this if i was your wife i would feed you poison well, not only was she frustrated, but the umpire was frustrated with her. And he got so frustrated with her, he said, if I was your husband, I'd eat it. Have you ever been confused? Have you ever been frustrated? Have you ever been discouraged? I'm sure most of us are somewhere in that, that, that way right now. I mean, we look at our world and we see what's going on. We see that there's no school. I'm sure the teachers are anxious the parents are flustered and frustrated they're realizing that their kids are not as as good as what they think they are and and they're just frustrated having to try to keep them from eating all the groceries the the stockpile of snacks before weeks in there's no sports like i said a while ago there's no there's no restaurants you can't even eat out uh, in a restaurant anymore we're constantly cooking and fixing things there's job loss people are being laid off from their job uh, uh, there's trying to get uh, unemployment we've got that going on and then lo and behold there's no toilet paper you can't find toilet paper anywhere there are several people I spoke with this week that said I, I I've never seen anything like this before a man 84 years old called me and just wanted to to let me know that uh, he loved me and he was praying for me he said in all my years I've never seen anything like this and we're thinking we're asking what is God saying to us what is God saying through all of this there's a lot of speculation and hypotheticals that people are thinking about they're giving their opinion to be fly, to be just quite honest with you I don't know what God is saying but I know that what I know what God has said. I don't know what he necessarily is saying in this, but we can look at his word and know what he has said. I was looking on the internet just this past week uh, on survival field guides. There's the U.S. Army survival field guide for any, any type of climate, any type of terrain, any type of circumstance. And man, there's a lot of weird stuff out there, bushcraft, one-on-one, -on -one, how to eat in the wilderness, how to cook in the wilderness. Let's look at the Word of God. Let's look at God's book. And let's find a way that we can survive this difficult time. I titled this message, An Untroubled Heart in a Troubling World. John chapter 14 is a famous passage of Scripture. In your Bible, it'll probably have pen marks. In some of your Bibles, it may have tear stains. In this passage, Jesus is giving last-minute instructions to his disciples and last-minute encouragement. I just want to look at verse 1 today. We don't want to keep you very long, and over the next few weeks, we'll develop the message as we go along. There's three or four ways that we could divide this, but in verse 1, God gives us a good vaccine for an old disease. That's the troubled heart. Let's look what it says here in John chapter 14 in verse 1. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He is wanting his disciples to move from perplexity to peace. 
We see heart trouble and we see heart trust in this text. He says in the first part, heart trouble. Let not your heart be troubled. I heard about this man who was known for his liquor and he explained the reason he drank was to drown his troubles. He said, I, uh, he says, after you drown them, or somebody asked him, after you drown them, why do you continue to drink? He said, you don't know my troubles. My troubles are excellent swimmers. I try to drown them, but they swim right up again. Life is full of trouble. Job said in Job chapter 5 and verse 7, yet, more, yet man is born of trouble as the sparks fly upward. Job 14 and 1 says, man who is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. We're having trouble. You're having trouble. We're trying to figure out how we're going to make it, how long this is going to last. No one really knows. We're trying to keep ourselves uh, from getting sick or keep our loved ones from getting sick, but we're having trouble. A father came home from the work one day just before supper, and he met his five-year-old daughter sitting on the sidewalk outside the house. His little girl was not smiling at all, and he said, is there something wrong, honey? She said, yes. I, all day long, I've been having trouble with your wife. We have all kinds of trouble, whether it's relational or physical or material. Trouble is everywhere. In our text, the context of our text, it's really a continuation of chapter 13. This is just hours before the cross. Jesus, in his last moments, he's spending them with his disciples, like I said a while ago, trying to encourage them, trying to give them instruction on what he expects from them and wants for them to do. And it amazes me that in Jesus' last moments, he's not self-absorbed. He's not selfish. He's not thinking about only himself. In chapter 13, he takes off his outer cloak, robes himself in the robe of a servant, and washes his disciples' feet. In the last moments, just before, in the shadows of the cross, he's about to be crucified for the sins of the world, and yet he is concerned with other people. We're seeing that even in this time, there are a lot of people who have a generous spirit and those that have a selfish spirit. In this last meal and in this last moment, Jesus has told them some things that really rocked their world. In, in chapter 13, he tells them really three ground, earth-shaking things that they're going to experience. One, he's going to be denied by one of his followers. One of them is going to betray him. And then he was going to leave them. That really rocked their world. Uh, he says that one of them would betray him. No one looked at Jesus. You look at parallel passages in the gospel. One of the, in one instance, they would all say, is it I? Is it I? And then they realize that Peter is going to deny the Lord. And Peter was kind of the ringleader. And if the leader could do that, what else could they do? Here's a group of guys that really burned their ships. They left all. They left their family. They left their fishing nets. They left their businesses. They left their, their parents. They left it all behind to follow him. And for three, almost three and a half years, they saw Jesus do things that, that no man had ever seen. They heard Jesus say things that no man has ever heard before. And just a few days before this, they walked into the city of Jerusalem in a parade. There were people lining the streets, waving palm branches, going before Jesus and after Jesus, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. It tells us how quickly things can change. In just a matter of days, they go from a parade to a funeral. Life has changed, changed really quickly and drastically in just a week or two. Just last week, we could go and eat what we wanted to. We could find any toilet paper amount that we wanted to. There were sports on TV. You didn't have to hunker down and stay in your house, but now everything has changed. Their life had changed quickly. The Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, 
for you don't know what a day brings forth. And we've experienced that in living color. And so you can imagine these emotions that they're feeling. They heard that he was going to be denied. They heard that he was going to be betrayed. And they heard that he was going to leave them. Can you imagine the emotions that they are feeling? I can't imagine the emotions that you're feeling. I have my own set of emotions that I keep going and dealing with day in and day out. I'm sure that they were perplexed. They were confused. They were scared. Uh, they were discouraged. They were worried. They were filled with sorrow and sadness. I'm sure they were shocked and disappointed. The days that we live in are really totally different than the days that this was wrote in. We live in different days than them because we have iPhones and we have cameras and we have Facebook and we have technology and we've got cars and restaurants and homes and hospitals and airplanes. And, and, and so the days uh, from which they live and we live are really totally different but if you really think about it, it's exactly the same. They're exactly the same because they experience disappointment and we are experiencing disappointment. They are experiencing loss and we experience loss. They had fears and worries and we have fears and worries. Will this ever end? Will the stock market come back? Will, will they have football? When will school go back into session? It's amazing to me that Jesus is sensitive to their troubles. Jesus doesn't bash them. He doesn't belittle them. He doesn't scold them. I'm thankful that Jesus is sensitive to my sorrows, that he cares for what concerns me. Peter said, cast all your care upon him for he cares for you. In this phrase in John chapter 14 and verse 1, it says, do not let your heart be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. It's the same word that is used in connection to Jesus three times in previous chapters. In John chapter 11, it says that he, was, he, was, he had trouble in his spirit because of the death of Lazarus and the grief that his friends were experiencing. In John chapter 12, he said he was troubled in his soul as he began to look towards the cross and what the agony and shame that he would experience. And then in John chapter 13, he is troubled in his spirit because he's going to be betrayed and denied by his followers. I'm thankful that he has concern for my hurting heart or heart trouble. You know, if we keep living... We're going to spend a night at the Heartbreak Hotel. And that's exactly where his disciples were. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. Heart trouble. So what are we to do? How are we to navigate this? What is to be our response as his followers? What kind of encouragement did he give to them in their moment of perplexity, in their moment of worry, anxiety, sorrow, disappointment, or shocking pain. He says in the text, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Heart trouble. The only cure for heart trouble is heart trust. Jesus knows all about our troubles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. In this text, he really gives us two commands. One's in the negative and one's in the positive. He tells us what we shouldn't do. We shouldn't let our heart be troubled. And then he tells us what we should do. We should trust in him. When he's saying, don't let your heart be troubled, that heart is really the fulcrum of your passions, your agenda, your, your desires, your, your goals, your plans, your emotions, and your actions. And that word trouble means to be agitated. It means to be burdened. He, he's saying don't let your troubles overrun your life or rule over your life. He's really saying don't let your trouble sink you. Don't let your trouble define you. 
Don't let your trouble derail you. One person said, you look at others, you'll be depressed. If you look at yourself, you'll get stressed. But if you look at Jesus, you'll be blessed. He says, trust in me. Believe in me. You believe in God, believe also in me. Believe, that means to cling to. That means to rely on. That means to trust in. He says, you believe God, you believe that God can split rivers and he can rain down manna and he can kill giants and, 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 and he can do all these incredible things. You believe God for that. Believe me also. Really, this is an incredible, shocking statement that Jesus would often make that really he is God. Someone said Matthew was written to the Jews to let, know, let them know that Jesus was king that Mark was written to the Romans to let them know that Jesus was servant, that Luke was written to the Greeks to let them know that Jesus was man, and that John was written to the world to let them know that Jesus is God. He is calling us to believe in who he is and what he can do. And that theme is found throughout the entirety of the Bible. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path Isaiah said in Isaiah 12 and 2 behold God is my salvation I will trust and not be afraid for yeah the Lord is my strength and my song he also has become my salvation the psalmist said in Psalm 56 and verse 3, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Now let's think about that for just a few moments. What does that mean for you? For some of you, that means to continue to trust, to continue to rely, to continue to cling to. He, he says you believe in God, believe also in me in the original language it really means keep on trusting keep on believing don't stop don't quit or those great theologians journey don't stop believing that's what he's saying in that text you see when we don't understand all that Jesus is up to we must cling and trust to what we know about Jesus what is Jesus, he is awesome, he is big, he is compassionate, he is dependable, he is eternal, he forgives us, he is good, he is holy, he is interceding for us, he is just, he is the king, he is the Lord, he is merciful, he is near, he is omniscient, he is provider, he is righteous, he is sufficient, he is truthful, he is upholding, he is victorious, and he is wise. What Jesus is letting us know, what he's calling us to do, is to let our faith override our questions, doubts, and fears. During an earthquake a few years ago, some inhabitants in a village were very much alarmed by what was happening. There was an elderly lady in that village whom they all knew and they were really surprised that she was calm and joyous in the midst of this earthquake and when it got when it got finished when it completed it's shaking one of them said mother how are you not afraid this is what she replied I rejoice to know that I have a God who can shake the world that's what Jesus is telling us to trust that we have a God who can shake the world. He is shaking this earth. He is shaking normality. He is shaking routine. And our prayer as of right now is, God, let's get it back to normal. But I'm telling you, friend, Jesus says in chapter 14, even chapter 16, he said, it's for, it's for your advantage that I leave. They didn't understand that it was advantageous for Jesus to leave them. And he says, it's for your advantage that I leave because I'm going to send you the helper or a comforter. There's going to be some good come out of this shaking. There's going to be some good come out of this trouble. We're going to learn that we don't need 
all this stuff to get by, to be satisfied, to be content. We're going to learn that our idols are all that they are. They are idols. They can't save us. They can't hear us. They can't fix us. They can't help us. We are to trust that God is good, that he is king, that he is madly in love with us, that he is gracious, that he really does have the whole world in his hands, that he forgives sinners, he helps the saints, that he is working behind the scenes, and that he can bring good out of bad. The song says, let not your heart be troubled, his tender word I hear, and resting on his goodness I lose my doubts and fears. Though the path, by the path he leadeth me, but one step I may see, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. So this not only means for some of you to keep on, continue trusting. You've come too far to turn back now. You've come too far to turn you back on the Lord now. But some of you need to start believing. Some of you need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Some of you have never put your faith, your personal faith, in a personal God. To be saved, it means to be rescued. It means to be delivered. For you to be lost, you don't have to do anything. John 3, 18 says, He who believes in him is not content, condemned, but he who does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But to be saved, you've got to believe. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Peter, or Paul and Silas were in jail in Acts 16 and God shook, shook the, the jail with an earthquake and the doors popped open and the, uh, the, the chains popped off and the jailer was about to kill himself. and He asked Paul, or Paul a question. In Acts 16, he says, Sir, what must I do to be saved? That's a profound question, isn't it? And that's where a lot of you are. You're thinking you've got to do something to be right with God. That you've got to go to church or get baptized or burn a candle or do this or that. and you're, that, That's going to make you right with God. That's not the answer. The profound question was followed by an urgent command. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Urgent. That's an urgent command. It means to do it now. Our world is fragile. We don't know how much longer the Lord's going to tarry his coming. And that's what we're imploring you and begging you to do is put your faith in Christ alone. That word believe means to believe in Jesus' claims. He claimed that he was the Messiah that he was sent from heaven, that he was the Son of God. He's not just a good teacher. If he was, you can't call him a good teacher and then say he's not who he says he was. That, that, that makes him a liar. Jesus is the Son of God. So you must believe his claims and you must believe his actions. John, later on in his gospel, wrote this. And truly, John 20, 30, and 31, and truly Jesus did many other things in, his pres in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That word believe means to accept as true or genuine, and then you surrender to that truth. John Patton was a missionary in islands in the Pacific, and he was wrestling with how to translate that word believe in or trust in in their language. They, they were cannibals, and he was trying to get them the gospel in their language. And he said there was no word for trust in their language, and a native servant came in and asked him what he was doing. And a guy, or he said, what am I doing? Patton asked him. He said, sitting at your desk, the, ramp, the man replied. Patton then raised both of his feet off the floor and sat back on his chair. He said, what am I doing now? 
The servant replied, to lean your whole weight upon. And that's the phrase that Patton used to translate the gospel of John whenever it said believe in Jesus. It means to lean your whole weight on. That's what I'm asking you to do right now. Right wherever you sit is to lean your whole weight, your whole life on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. A man was walking one day and it was pitch black night. He fell over a cliff. On the way down, he mad, managed to grab a small shrub out of the side of this mountain. Desperately, he began to call out for help, and a voice answered and said, What do you want? I'm stuck down here holding on to this tree. I can't hold on too much longer. Can you help me? Yes, came the reply. Who are you? The man asked. I'm God, replied the voice. For a while, or he says, What do you want me to do? Asked the man. Let go of the tree, said God. Said the man, or said God. For a while there was silence. Then the man called out and said, Is there anyone else up there? Some of you are looking for something that's not there. The Bible tells us not to trust in horses or trust in men. But Jesus said, Trust in me. But as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. The words of the hymn, and I'm done. Come every soul by sin oppressed. There's mercy with the Lord. And he will surely give you rest by trusting in his word. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. Right where you are, you can begin a relationship with Jesus. You admit that you're a sinner, you confess that you believe that Jesus is who he says he is. He is the Son of God, and he did what he did on the cross for you. And if you'll just admit that and ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, you can begin a walk with the Lord. I'm going to encourage you, church, to keep trusting, keep believing, hang on in there, hang on in there. God loves us, he's for us, He's, at, the, he's in, at work in the midst of us. We can't wait till we're back together again. But until then, keep believing in the Lord. If you'd like to make a decision to follow Christ, send us a message on Facebook, post a question on the feed, give us a call, and let us pray for you. Church, if you have a prayer request, send, put, post that or send a message or a text to me or Brother Chris or Brother Captain, and we'll be praying for you. I just want you to know we love you. We're praying for you. And we long for the day that we'll be back in this place together again. Let's pray. Father, I ask, sir, that you speak, that you use these words, your words, to encourage and to troubled hearts. We do live in a troubling world. But God, help us not to be ruled and dominated by trouble. Help us to trust in you. Help those who are scared and afraid. God, help them just to hang on to you, to keep on believing. But I believe there's someone that has watched this service that has never made a decision to follow Christ. They know about Jesus. They've been to church, and they've been around people who know Jesus, and they may have gone through rituals and, and customs, but God, they have never really put leaned all their weight on you. Lord, I pray that you'll draw them to the cross and they'll be gloriously and wonderfully saved. Lord, help us, help us, hold us, and guide us until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.